In pretty much all of my 1920s spotlight videos, I've talked about famous 1920s celebrities that many people with any interest in that time would probably recognize. But in this video, I'm going to do the exact opposite. I wanted to challenge myself with this one since I didn't have a lot of source material to go off of. This is the story of a forgotten child performer named Esther Lee Jones. We aren't completely sure of the exact year that baby Esther Lee Jones was born. It was likely either in 1919 or 1921, and she grew up in Chicago. Being a child performer, it wasn't uncommon for parents or agents to purposely change the age of a famous child in order to make people think they were older or younger, depending on the motive. Anyway, baby Esther was a vaudeville performer who sang, danced, and acted in skits. She had started performing on the vaudeville circuit by at least 1926, though she had already had some dancing experience before then. And it was in her vaudeville performances that she incorporated nonsensical syllables and sounds into her singing. In other words, scatting. While scatting had been used in recordings for at least a decade, though had almost definitely existed for a longer time, it was in 1926 that Louis Armstrong really helped popularize it in jazz in his recording, Heebie Jeebies. But according to the information we have, Jones put her own little spin on it, and apparently specialized in B and D sounds. Some examples of this would be boo boo boo, doo doo doo, booty doo doo, and so on. And her phrasing and interpolations were, by all written accounts, unique, though I can't give any concrete examples of that. Scat singing really started to increase in popularity by this time, and Jones's act was right on the trend. She became quite popular on the stage in the urban north. Unfortunately, she never made any recordings of her songs and there is no surviving footage of her. There is evidence that there was a movie tone sound short made of her performing in 1928, but any trace of it has been lost. A later short from 1931 is reportedly in an archive in Brazil. It seems that there was a talkie made in 1931 in Berlin, but I'm not sure if that's the same one as the Brazil one. But we do know that her signature songs were the Al Jolson tunes Sunny Boy and Mammy both of which have a strong racial context. She would sometimes perform with a white performer in blackface in a sort of minstrel show act. Other songs she was known to sing included Don't Be Like That, Is There Anything Wrong In That, Wa Da Da, That's My Weakness Now, I Can't Give You Anything But Love Baby, and Breakaway. Baby Esther's popularity was beginning to peak in 1928 and 1929, when 1920s pop culture was flourishing in America. She was so popular that she was often directly compared with Florence Mills and Josephine Baker. Both of these women were widely respected and praised in the black community, so to give the same respect to such a young performer was quite a compliment. Baby Esther began a tour around Europe in 1929, achieving huge success there. She was especially popular in the big cities, such as Paris, the very city where Josephine Baker had become a sensation after escaping the racism in her home country. Even here, Baby Esther was likened to a miniature Josephine Baker. It was during the European tour that she had had a little incident in Stockholm, Sweden, where she was refused milk at a restaurant, something which caused a minor international diplomacy problem. I'll talk more about that in a second. So, while there is very little information about Baby Esther out there, I was able to find some newspaper clippings about her that some websites have compiled. So instead of just speculating and theorizing on the generalities of her career, I thought I would just read one of these for you, and you can interpret that information however you like. It's the longest and most detailed one I could find, though there are more out there. And it will talk about that incident in Stockholm I mentioned as well. As you will hear mentioned in the following article, Baby Esther was prominently featured in a French magazine, with two pages written about her, as well as being put on the cover. Unfortunately, I could not find a digital copy of this issue. So anyway, the following article is from a black periodical dated October 5th, 1929. It offers an interesting retrospective on her career up to that point. Keep in mind though that it wasn't uncommon to distort details of famous celebrities back then, especially child stars, and especially when it came to their backstories. And there is no way to corroborate many of these facts. But without further ado, here it is. $750 a week her pay now. Miss Esther Jones, 10-year-old dancing star, who rose from a street dancer four years ago in Chicago to the top rung of child artists. 
With Ma and Pa and a manager, she is touring European capitals on a $750 a week guarantee. When not earning a living by dancing, Esther plays with dolls like any other normal child. Paris, little Esther, the 10-year-old dancing wonder, accompanied by her mother, Mrs. Jones of Chicago, and her manager, Sidney Garner, passed through this city on her way to Nice and Monte Carlo to fill engagements there. She is said to be the highest paid child artist in the world. She has just left Berlin, where she played at the Winter Garden at a salary of $750 a week for six weeks. Her story reads like a fairy tale. Four years ago, she was playing in the streets of Chicago, dancing the Charleston just for fun. Her companions were poor like herself. Now, she has jewels, and her dresses are being made by some of the best designers. As to offers to appear both on the stage and in the moving pictures, she is getting more than she could fill in 10 years from all over Europe. At 10, little Esther is wealthy. She scored her first success when just a little over 5. There was a Charleston contest and she won first prize. A white manager saw her and got her engagements in New York, Chicago, Toronto, and other cities. Later, he brought her to Europe, where she made an instant hit. Appearing at the Casino de Paris, the Moulin Rouge, the Empire, and other theaters, her audiences went wild about her, while the Parisian press gave much space to her. Vu, the leading illustrated weekly, devoted its entire front page to her picture and carried a two-page story about her. Since then, she has danced and sang in many private homes all over Europe, as well as for the King and Queen of Spain and the King and Queen of Sweden. Vu said of her, Dressed in a costume with spangles, like some brilliant little butterfly, the light of the projectors is shining on her. With surprise, one realizes that her flute-like voice comes distinctly to each in the audience. She sings at first, her body softly swaying to the accompaniment of the popular American songs that she interprets with a very seductive mixture of seriousness and childish mischief. Truly, she is an amusing and delightful little mimic. Now she trembles as if caught by sudden fear, or else she places her hand on her stomach as if suffering from the most frightful pain. Then suddenly, she is all laughter again. The song finished. Little Esther dances. She dances so lightly, and so freely does her body play above the hips, that really it seems she does not need legs to move about with. Now she dances easily on one foot, while she draws the other unused behind her. But what struck me most of all regarding this little black fairy is that throughout the entire performance, she remains the little child who is only playing for her own amusement. Later, when I visited her in her dressing room and saw her playing with one of her dolls that some of her innumerable admirers have sent her, I asked her whether she ever got bored with her act. She looked at me, her black eyes big with surprise, and answered, Why? And this is all true. In spite of her successes, Little Esther has remained the merry, laughing child she was on the streets of Chicago. She loves play, all her work is as play, and to make a hit with her, play with her. She is full of life and speed, and her build is almost perfection itself. Her legs, arms, and back are wonderfully strong and muscular, and her skin is as smooth as silk. She is so gay and winsome, that when she walks on the streets, she always has an admiring crowd behind her. And when she comes into a restaurant, many strangers call to her as she passes. The London Sunday People says of her, Thousands flock no longer to herself, or the clever American ballet, the Moulin Rouge, to see Mistinget girls, or the beautiful women of the chorus, but to applaud a little mite, ten years old, who has won fame and wealth within the space of a few weeks. We are living in an age of speed, but this amazing little child has broken every record of sudden theatrical success. Of all the countries she has visited, little Esther has had the biggest success in Sweden, not because of her talent alone, but because the owner of a restaurant, one Branda Tompton, who had lived in America, refused to serve her a glass of milk because she is colored. The Swedish papers made it hot for Tompton, while little Esther, her mother, and her manager received invitations from some of the highest people socially to visit them in their homes, just to show how strongly they disapproved of Tompton's conduct. The Dagblad called the incident the greatest scandal Stockholm has ever had, causing as much sensation as a real crime. 
The Stockholm Dagblad also made an inquiry at the leading restaurants and hotels regarding their attitude toward receiving colored people, and it said, Our inquiry shows that in all our leading restaurants and hotels, Little Esther or any other Negro would be received with pleasure, except at Branda Tompton's. Little Esther, especially, would be welcomed because of her popularity. Such a shower of ridicule poured in on Tompton that he was forced to close. He was caricatured in several of the leading papers, while Little Esther's popularity rose higher than ever. When she left, a crowd of schoolchildren came to see her off, presenting her flowers and inviting her to return to Stockholm. Mrs. Jones, a modest, quiet little woman, is very proud of her daughter. To her, the astonishing success of her little girl seems more like a dream than reality. This leap from humble circumstances to wealth and popularity. As you heard from that article, Baby Esther was a massive success in Europe. Although she had also been successful in New York, she said that she never went to the South because of all the racism. And, like many other black performers from America, she likely became intoxicated with how well she was treated in Europe overall. Actually, most of the information about her career comes from European or South American magazines. That's why many of the images I've shown in this video have text in foreign languages. But all good things must come to an end. The problem is, we don't exactly know when Baby Esther's career actually ended. It seems that her extensive tour of Europe and South America ended in 1933 or 1934, and she struggled to remain relevant in the US. Now this is where we must replace facts with theories. During the time Baby Esther was in Europe, the Great Depression hit, putting an end to many of the trends in pop culture of the 1920s, as hedonism and extravagance became very unfashionable. While Baby Esther was not exactly a flapper since she was a young child, her style was very much rooted in the 1920s, in that sort of hectic culture. This could possibly explain why she faded away. Also, she had been away from the US for so long that she was likely forgotten by many who had known her previously. But probably the biggest reason why she faded away has been the curse of many child stars. She grew up. She no longer had her childish demeanor, which probably made many of her talents less interesting to an audience. The last details we have about her are that she performed acrobatics throughout much of 1934 in America, and she also still sang and did some dancing. But there would be one more time in 1934 when her name would be mentioned again, though very briefly. I usually don't talk too much about what happened to the spotlighted person after the 1920s, but in this case, there's an important thing that I want to talk about before ending this video. Baby Esther Lee Jones might have been completely forgotten had it not been for a lawsuit the singer Helen Kane filed against Fleischer Studios in 1932. Kane accused the animators of stealing her likeness for the character Betty Boop. Kane's Boop Boop a Doop singing style pretty much defined her entire career, and since Betty Boop was also defined by a very similar thing, Kane wanted to preserve her status as the original Boop Boop a Doop girl. But what did this have to do with Baby Esther? Well, her name featured prominently in the defense against Kane's accusations. Jones had used a very similar singing style before Kane was doing it, and the defense argued that Kane had seen Jones perform and copied her style which, if true, would discredit Kane, and the case could be thrown out. It was alleged that Kane and her manager, who also happened to be Jones's manager, took her to the Everglades Club, where Jones was performing, sometime in 1928. In the end, Kane lost. There was a lot of other evidence other than Baby Esther's, and it was never directly stated whether her performances played a major part in the ruling. But what the trial did do was bring Baby Esther Lee Jones's name back from obscurity, if only for a short time. Because Betty Boop remains a very well-known character, it's only a matter of time before fans look up information about her and find out about Helen Kane and the trial, and they will always see Jones mentioned in there somewhere. And those people might wonder, who was this little girl, and want to find out more about her. It might be a very indirect way of getting to her, but without it, there would be practically nothing. There's actually something very ironic about Helen Kane trying to save her unique legacy, because by attempting to do so, she inadvertently saved the legacy of someone else who could have easily claimed the title that she was seeking. And of course, because of this lawsuit, Baby Esther Lee Jones will always be linked with Betty Boop, despite having no actual connection to the character, but I guess it's better than nothing. So in short, Esther Lee Jones, while mostly forgotten now, 
was a very popular entertainer in her time. She was perhaps the most popular black child star, with the possible exception of Alan Hoskins, who played the Farina character from Our Gang. More so than Farina, however, Esther faded from public consciousness, partly due to there being no known audio or video recordings of her, partly because she spent the peak of her career abroad, and partly because she just grew up. There has never been any book written about baby Esther's life and very little to go on outside of articles for magazines and newspapers at the time of her popularity. So, for this video, I had to rely mostly on two sites. First is the Betty Boop Wiki. Because Baby Esther is now one of the major contenders for the title of the original Betty Boop, the site has focused a lot of attention on her. The other site is the official Baby Esther Lee Jones website, which can be found on WordPress. This is also a fan site in a way, but it really does strive to set the record straight when it comes to information and misinformation about Baby Esther. Both of these sites have contributed unique images that I included in this video, the best of which are a series of incredible color images of her, probably the best known photos in existence of Baby Esther. I became interested in the story of Esther Lee Jones after discovering that we know so little about her after her career faded away. The rest of her life is so unknown that we don't even know when she died. There is, of course, a very, very small chance she might still be living, but we will probably never know. Whatever the case, I sincerely hope she had a long, happy life. Well, that's all for now, all you sheiks and gals out there, but stay tuned for more tales from the Jazz Age.